Okay, in the interest of time, I think we'll just um, launch into welcomes. And if, um, if more people continue to join, uh, that would be great. So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar on tough topics in cancer. Our, web our topics today include presentations on sexual health and intimacy, oncofertility, and genetic testing. I'm Rebecca Armstrong, Manager of Patient Education Programs with the Canadian Breast Cancer Network. Before we get started, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping items. The session is being recorded and will be available on our website for anyone who may have missed it. I will send out a link once the recording is available. You'll be able to find previously recorded webinars that address a variety of different topics on our website as well. I'd like to extend our sincere appreciation to our sponsors for the session um, who have provided support through in-kind or unrestricted educational grants. Novartis, our gold level sponsor, Pfizer and Gilead, our silver level sponsors, and AstraZeneca, Merck, Daiichi Senkyo, and Life Labs are bronze level sponsors. Today we are joined by three expert speakers. There will be a brief question and answer period following each of today's presentations. Please feel free to submit your questions throughout the session using the Q&A function at the bottom or right of your screen. I'd now like to welcome our host for this session, Kathy Amendalea, the chair of the board for the Canadian Breast Cancer Network. Thank you, Rebecca. Welcome again, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I am pleased to welcome and introduce our expert speakers, Dr. Melanie Altas, Dr. Jeffrey Roberts, and Don Sigiliano. We are very, very appreciative of the time our speakers offered to the patient community by joining us today. Our first presentation is on sexual health and intimacy, navigating sexual health during and after breast cancer treatment. Dr. Melanie Altas is gynecologist and sexual medicine physician. She is director of the BC Center for Vulvar Health. As a consultant for BC Cancer, she specializes in providing care for women with sexual medicine and menopausal concerns during and after cancer treatment. Welcome, Dr. Altas. Please Thank you, Kathy. It's um, it's my pleasure to be here today and um, to talk about one of my favorite um, one of my favorite topics. So I'm just going to share my screen so we can dive right into everything. So my talk today is on exploring sexual health and intimacy um, following a breast cancer diagnosis. And this talk could, I could actually do a full day workshop on this talk, but um, what I'd like to do over the next um, 20 minutes is just um, cover some of the impacts that breast cancer, the diagnosis and treatment can have on sexual health and relationships, and also to provide you with some information to help get you started in, in addressing, um, in addressing these concerns. So sexual health is actually so important that the World Health Organization has put out a statement saying that sexual health is fundamental to overall health and well-being of the individual, of couples, families, and even, um, even communities. And um, so this, we know that sexual health is very, very, very important to, um, to quality of life. So breast cancer, um, as you likely know, is very common. In Canada, there's almost 30,000 um, new diagnoses per year. And we know over a lifetime, about one out of eight to 10 women um, will be affected personally by a breast cancer diagnosis. And we also know that treatments are really, really effective. Um, so we need to really come up with some ways to address some of those quality of life issues um, that can have a long lasting, long lasting impact. So you likely know this, but there's actually, there's been a lot of studies that have shown that the incidence of altered sexuality in people with breast cancer is very, very high. It's long lasting and it can significantly diminish quality of life for both um, the individual as well as their, their partner. And I put up, this is likely not a surprise to you, but when I give this talk to physicians and other providers, this is actually a really common expression that I'll see. And many physicians um, who work within the breast cancer community are really surprised that they may have gone their entire career um, treating breast cancer and they've never asked about sexual health or they've never had someone ask them about sexual health. 
surprisingly shocking. So how are we doing in addressing this high incidence of sexual function? Well, we're not doing really well. And there's been, um, this may have been your experience, but there's also been a lot of research that has proven that we are not doing really well in addressing this. There was a recent study published in the last, um, in the last year where they looked at a different type of cancer where they looked at gynecologic cancer. So this would be ovarian cancer, uterine cancer, cervical cancer. And they felt that they found that 90% of patients felt that they should have been asked about their sexual health, but more than 50% were not asked about sexual health. But those who were asked close to 100% found it really helpful. So what are the barriers or why, why aren't we doing well? So we can divide these into what I would say are patient barriers and then also physician or provider barriers. So when we look at patient barriers, we can divide this further into self or kind of internal inward looking factors and then external factors. So the self-centered factors would be a, a person's belief about their own comfort, their own ability, or even their own responsibility in discussing sexual health. So this would be um, a situation where someone would say, I don't know, I don't know where to start. I don't have the words to describe what I'm feeling or what I what I need. But the patient can also have um, external barriers or more physician-centered barriers. And this would be where they're unsure or even fearful or intimidated by what the provider's reactions to discussing sexual health may be. So this may be something like, you know, I'm afraid my physician may react negatively, I'm worried about offending them, or I'm worried that they may become embarrassed. So I'm, I'm just not going to ask, we're going to, we're going to avoid it for now. But then there are physician barriers as well. There are um, time constraints within our current healthcare setting. We don't allow a lot of time to discuss quality of life um, issues. And especially now, I think everyone knows across the country, our healthcare system is in a significant crisis. But we also know that physicians, nurse practitioners, nurses, they don't get a lot of um, education about um, particularly women's sexual health in their training. And I know that from going through residency and medical school here in Canada, that there was minuscule amount of time dedicated um, to women's sexual health and also to menopause. But there can be a lot of assumptions or what I'd say would be unconscious biases about who sexuality is important to or about a patient's sexuality. And this is where things like age, culture, religion come into play, or even the stage of the cancer. So if someone has advanced cancer, metastatic or palliative cancer, that sexuality is probably not important to them. And these are all this lack of education, this awareness, this lack of language and knowledge and unconscious biases. These are all things that, um, that are manageable and that we can address. And that's what I'm going to do for the rest of rest of the talk is give you some introductory language skills and education. So many of you have heard this quote by Francis Bacon that states knowledge is power. But there's a lesser known quote by an economics professor named Robert Bryce. And he said that knowledge is power, but shared knowledge is power multiplied. And this is something that I strongly believe in. I see on a day-to-day -day, um, day -day basis in my practice where um, I work at the cancer agency here in Vancouver and I work with people who have been through a cancer diagnosis and treatment. And I can um, easily see on a daily basis the impact of education and knowledge and language has. So when people are referred to me, the question I often get asked is, so are my sexual problems biological, psychological, or, or kind of where do they lie? And in reality, this is, this is actually a false dichotomy that's difficult to, to really make or tease out. Given that biological, psychological, and sociocultural factors are all operating, even at one time, and interact with each other. So let's look at the impact of breast cancer and treatment in each of these domains. So the biologic one is probably a little bit easier to, um, to understand because this is more physical. And this would be the impact of menopause, either with chemotherapy, 
with um, some people of surgical removal of both ovaries as a preventative me measure. And some people are, are on long-term hormonal therapy like aromatase um, inhibitors. And that will put you into menopause where you have the hot flushes, but you also get vulvar and vaginal dryness, which can cause pain with sex. The psychological factors would include things like anxiety, fear of recurrence, the changes to, um, to the physical self can sometimes lead to changes in self-image and sexual self-esteem. But then we also have this, this kind of overlying so sociocultural perspective. And this is, by, by that I mean um, the role that we, that society believes people should play in relationships or the way that relationships should be from a sexual perspective. And even when people go through um, a, a significant healthcare um, experience, one of the people in the relationship it frequently takes on the caregiver role. And that can change how, um, how that person is viewed sexually within the relationship. So I think even from this kind of superficial um, overview, you can see how the contributing factors to sexuality can actually be very complicated. So what I'd like to do is just pull out one of those biologic factors that I talked about. And we're going to talk about the impact of menopause on vulva and vaginal health. And by this, I mean vaginal dryness and subsequently painful sex. So when people go through menopause, they have a decrease in estrogen in their body. And estrogen is responsible for making the, the tissue in the vulva and vagina healthy. So making it thick and plump and stretchy. So when the estrogen decreases, then we, the tissue can become thin, easily irritated, and it's not going to stretch as much. So this may cause day-to-day -day dryness and difficulty with sexual, um, sexual insertion. When people are on aromatase inhibitors, this decreases the estrogen in the body even more. So the aromatase inhibitors will put you into a more severe menopause. So I like to divide this approach into um, kind of what I call in the moment. So what are things that you can use during insertional sexual activity that can help? And this is where we come to lubricants. The most common lubes that people use are water-based lubes. So if you went into a pharmacy and you looked at the shelf, that's what you're gonna see is water-based lubes. But when you're talking about a water-based product, not all of them are created equal. And you have to take into account two properties of water-based product, which are the pH and the osmolality. And for many water-based products, those pHs and osmolality are not conducive to helping with the pain people experience in menopause. And if a product is hyperosmolar, which many of them are, that means when it's put on the skin, it's going to draw water out of it. So in the long term, it may make it um, make that dryness worse. So around the time of menopause, this is where I'd ask people to explore using silicone or oil-based lubes. And those are really good for people who are experiencing dryness, rubbing, or friction, um, friction sensation. Then the next um, area to look at is not in the moment, but what can you do as maintenance or prevention? And this is something that would you would use on a regular basis, like you use moisturizer on your hands or on your on your face. And there are really good non-hormonal products that are out there. And the ones that I'd encourage you to explore are the ones that contain hyaluronic acid. And you may have heard of hyaluronic acid before because this is what dermatologists use like for face wrinkles. And it works really well in the valve and the vagina. It does the same thing. So this would be something that you would use on a regular basis. And some of the hyaluronic products are Gynotroph, Repigyne, May, Feels Amazing. So those contain HLA and um, plus or minus vitamin E. Using those on a regular, a daily basis, two to three times a week, can really help to thicken that tissue and increase that stretch stretchability. And I find about 50% of women who use this on a regular basis will be really happy with it. So this was kind of just an overview. I covered a lot of stuff. Um, and what we have actually done at, on my website, my team's website, so we're at the BC Centre for Vulva Health. I've put our web address up there. We have patient handouts. And under the patient handout section, you can see there the second one down is breast cancer and sexual health. And that's where I've talked about basically in more detail what I've covered on the last two slides. 
One thing I do want to touch base on, though, is estrogen. And when I mention estrogen in breast cancer, this is the reaction I usually that I usually get. But um, for those 50% of women who maybe don't respond to the hyaluronic acid products or the non-hormonal products, it is very reasonable to have a discussion with your physician about using what we call topical estrogen. So that's estrogen that's used in the vulva and the vagina. It's absorbed into the vulva and vaginal skin. It doesn't get absorbed into your, into your system. And there has been a lot of decades of research that supports the safety of using topical estrogen in breast cancer patients. This is a statement um, put out by the American College of OBGYN that talks about um, the safety and the use of estrogen in breast cancer patients. The um, Canadian Society of OBGYN has a similar statement, and so does the North American Menopause Society. So all of these societies, among many others, support the use or having that discussion about using topical estrogen for breast cancer patients. So. Let's say that we fix that pain, that dryness that you're experiencing. And I ask someone that I'm seeing in my clinic, so if I fix this pain for you, if I make intercourse um, not as painful, will you be sexually happy? And for some people, they say absolutely yes. But there are some who kind of look at me like this and like, oh, I'm not really sure. I don't have any desire. I don't have any sex drive. And so I'm going to spend the next few slides going through how sexual desire works in women and how that is actually tied in to people who are experiencing painful sex. So when we think about sex drive or libido, what we commonly think of is what we see in the movies or we see in the front cover of books or in magazines where desire is this spontaneous, this urgency, this craving that just comes up out of the blue. And that's not actually what happens in real life for the vast majority of women. There are some women who will experience desire in that way, but the vast majority do not. And so one thing that I start off doing is explaining to people how desire works for the vast majority of women and how dryness and painful sex can play a role and impact desire. So what we're looking for in, um, in the sexual response cycle is starting from a place of what we call neutral. And this doesn't mean apathetic or numb. It means that you're open, you're willing, you're receptive, but maybe you don't have that craving or that urgency right away. And then depending on your reasons, and the reasons can be what we call positive, which are wanting connection, wanting emotional release, wanting stress relief. There was one study that was done where they actually found 237 reasons that people engage in intimacy. So depending on your reasons, depending on the environment, does the environment feel safe? Um, are you worried that children are going to come in? Does the environment feel romantic? Do you feel sexy? And that may be, you know, light, sense anything that makes you feel romantic or sexy. The brain looks at this information. So are you starting from neutral? Are your reasons positive? Is your stimuli and environment romantic? Your brain looks at this and your brain decides if you're going to experience arousal. And that's that emotional and that physical um, arousal that comes with intimacy. And then this is where desire comes into play. And it's what we call responsive rather than that spontaneous desire. And this is the desire to continue being intimate in the moment. Then if the outcome is pleasurable, this will lead into you being neutral the next time. But if the outcome is not pleasurable, so if the outcome is painful, if your reasons are not met, um, then, it, then you start doing things out of duty, obligation, maybe fear of losing a partner or fear of not fulfilling that role of a, of a wife. And then a lot of women experience shame in this situation. They'll start to skip the environment, skip those things that make them feel romantic or sexy. And they want to just get it over with. So maybe they won't even focus on feeling arousal um, before intimacy. 
And then what we see, instead of going to neutral, being open, willing, and receptive, we enter into what's called um, aversion or the sexual, um, the sexual avoidance cycle. And then this whole cycle becomes emphasized. So you have more negative reasons, that duty, fear, shame, continue to skip all of this. You're not feeling arousal. And if you don't experience arousal, you will not experience desire. Those two things are very intimately linked and the outcome will be worse. And you just continue to reinforce um, this sexual avoidance cycle. So I find just having this awareness of the cycle exists, going through being mindful, what's coming into play for me, what are some things that we can shift? So if we make the outcome better, if we make sex less, less painful, then will I be neutral? Or do we need to look at some of these other things? Do we need to look at um, my reasons, the stimuli? Do we need to look at how my brain is processing things? Maybe is anxiety coming into play, fatigue, stress? Maybe are judgments about myself and how I look? Am I maybe distracted during intimacy and thinking about all of these other things that I need to do? I find just being aware of the cycle is a really good place to, to start. Some books, I'm just going to end off giving you some book recommendations. Um, these are two books that I highly recommend to people. In both of these, they talk about um, responsive desire. The first one is Better Sex Through Mindfulness um, by Dr. Lori Brado. She's a psychologist in, in Vancouver. And the second book is um, Come As You Are by Emily, Emily Nagoski. So I'm going to end there and take questions. Um, and you can, if there's anything you want to ask aside from this, you can reach out to the email there and you can always follow my Instagram account. It's hello Valve, and we talk about a lot of Valve for health, health issues. All right. And I'm just going to stop sharing. We'll take your questions. Okay. Thank you very much. That was an excellent presentation. You touched on very important topic. I know it's bigger than what you just discussed. But that, that's a very good start. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions that came to mind as you started to discuss the topic. And uh, I'm, I'm going to put it all together. Like culturally, I'm sure that makes a difference, right? In certain cultures, certain beliefs. Uh, having a, a discussion with a male physician, I get that a lot. A lot of women find that they, they just don't have that comfort level to discuss that intimacy with a, a male physician. It happens, especially in certain cultures. And then what what is the, the discussion around having couple counseling? Because it involves both the husband and the wife or the partners, right? When this is happening in their life. So those yeah. are the things that just come to mind as we speak to the comfort and the psychological component of it. Obviously, there are other things that come into play, like uh, uh, comorbidities. Have they had sexual uh, problems before? And then another thing that comes to mind is how many report to you that uh, they wish they could have discussed it and they find that they weren't able to discuss it and that it really bothers them not to be yeah. able to that that level of uh, intimacy that they used to have pre-diagnosis I know it's a lot to unpack but <laughs> yeah yeah Kathy you, you know what you've touched on so many really important things and I think right from the beginning um you know talking about the barriers that um that people face bringing things up to their up to their healthcare team there are just so many barriers there and you know, having a different gendered um, physician can definitely be a barrier. The there's a lot of um, you know cultural factors that come into play. Kind of from I would say from the the patient's pers perspective, if they're in a culture or society where it's not discussed, which is also you know our society as well. But then, well, we'll I I know some people who probably experienced unconscious biases on the part of the physician where they've made assumptions about a person's age or their culture and that. Um, that they don't want to talk about sexuality, or maybe it's not as important to them. There's just oh, so many layers, so many layers there. Um, and then the oh, about the the other question you had was about the partner. So very frequently in my clinic, I um, I'll see women will usually come to their appointments by themselves for my clinic, um, and uh, and what I what I offer, and many times when I go through that sexual response um, cycle with people, many of them will ask me if they can bring their partner the next time so that I can explain it to them. Um, 
and as part of the psychoeducation, but also many patients will, will be able to go home and have that conversation with their partner. And that's one of the things that I encourage in my clinic is just, you know, obtaining that language and the knowledge to be able to talk about sex. Because um, usually people don't talk about sex until it becomes a problem. And then, um, and you know, in our society, our sexual education in schools doesn't teach us how to talk about sex in that way. We're very focused on STDs and, and contraception and not talking about um, about sexual problems in that way. So it can be a new a new experience for many people. I find um, what where I would recommend couples counseling early on would be if if I felt there was a lot of conflict in the relationship. So um, maybe a lot of resentment um, on either side and that they needed more of a like psychological professional to help with that. Um, that would be something where if they wanted to work on the relationship, a couples counselor would be highly recommended in, in that area. Um, and then uh, definitely, I think um, many, many, many patients out there would wish that their um, would wish that their care team would ask about um, about sexual health. And it's actually something I do a lot of um, educational events for physicians, and and that's requests for me to speak have increased significantly over. Um, I would say the last year and a half. So I'm doing a lot of talks um, for people. And part of my talks is to give the physician the language, like how do you in a neutral way ask about sexual health? And then even if you don't know what to do, how can you answer that question and give them resources and, and kind of moving away from that need as a physician to fix something? And, um, and it's okay to ask about something where you don't, maybe you don't know the answer right away. So yeah. And and the, the other question I have is regarding like right from the beginning, when somebody is diagnosed, uh, uh, how often are they told that they're, they could experience, um, you know, a decrease in sexuality and why medication, this may cause, you know, some issues of you, you know, and psychologically, uh, of course, that, that really comes to, to mind really, really in the front because, uh, women are afraid of recurrence. They're afraid of, uh, th that's in the back of their mind. Having pleasure for the first little while might be something that they're even afraid to experience because they're so uh, grateful to have overcome the first step of having had the diagnosis. So it, I think the, it, it would be important that they get this discussion with either a nurse pivot or, or some multidisciplinary team member that would be able to go into detail on how this could affect. And if they'd like to know more, they can ask questions. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, a common question that comes up is in, in kind of the medical community is when is the best time to have this de detailed discussion. And certainly, at, you know, at the, the beginning of the appointments before the treatment has started, many people feel that's not a good time because people are so focused on just getting rid of the cancer. And, um, but then when do you tell, talk to people about the potential impact of the, the treatment and how can you phrase that in a way that is, um, is impactful and people can retain that knowledge and then at a later time go into, go into detail um, when it's appropriate for that patient. And, and maybe even do we have to, you know, in medicine, we kind of have these very standard algorithms, you know, we do one, two, three, and four, and maybe is there a way to introduce individualization there? So, is there maybe someone on their first appointment, maybe they want all that information, or maybe someone doesn't want it until they're totally sure that the cancer is gone from their body. And can we individualize that? That would be, that would be ideal for sure. Great, yeah. Great, great, great response. We have a question from Dr. Roberts. Oh, yeah, Dr. Altus, fantastic talk. Um, yeah. That. It's uh, for sure uh, under, uh, under discussed for sure. Uh, and I'm guilty of that through the fertility practice, for sure. It's just, you have limited time and that doesn't come up, of course, in case there's not sperm getting in the uterus. That's usually how it comes up with, uh, with me, but yeah. is there, is there, uh, and we've tried to develop one for fertility as an intake for AYA, uh, for fertility. And I think we came up with a question of 
for patients, are you interested in future fertility as mm -hmm. a way to trigger the discussion? Yeah. Um, is there something that uh, as a single sentence or something I can we can do as physicians to broach the topic? Because it's a difficult one, obviously, to bring up, especially if the partner's in the room. Yeah. 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 I think, yeah. And, you know, you're right. Particularly, you know, AYA or adolescent young adult cancer patients, these are, are really prevalent issues, particularly because they may not be in their kind of long term um, relationship at that time. But, um, the, the question that I um, that I give during my talks is just to say something like, you know, it's really common for people um, who with breast cancer who have gone through this treatment will have concerns about about their sexual health. Is this something that you've you've experienced? And um, what's and so I see this this is happening more because I run the sexual medicine clinic at the cancer agency. See, so then if someone says yes, then they just say, great, I'll refer you to Dr. Altez. But um, so I'm actually seeing, seeing, I'm getting more, like way more referrals now, which is great. So, so I think, yes, having that question, but then also we need to back it up. So physicians need to have resources because um, I think in the medical community, we get really uncomfortable when we don't know the answer mm -hmm. or we can't fix something. So right. um, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. good. Using examples, uh, certainly we use a lot like many patients do this and then it, it certainly yeah. is a soft way of of uh bringing it up rather than asking them do you have that or do you yeah. have this yeah yeah yeah, yeah okay. absolutely absolutely yeah well thank you thank you so much i think my takeaway is that it might be better for patients to discuss it early on so it doesn't just sit in the back of their mind as they're going through the journey of their cancer treatments and their partners are involved and this way they they can they can work at it when time happens naturally maybe first if people ask and you know they want to know more i think it might be a good way to just get it in their head and then park it and then you know move along as it comes naturally thank you yeah. so much that was a great presentation thank you Obviously not enough time but yeah. that was wonderful. Thank you so much. Thanks Dr. so much, Kathy. Okay, so um, our next presentation is on oncofertility. fertility. Cancer treatments impact on fertility and options for preservation. Uh, Dr. Jeffrey Roberts is co-director of Pacific, Pacific Center for Reproductive Medicine and the president of Fertile Future. His focus is the advancement of fertility, Preservation for Young Women with Cancer. So I welcome you, Dr. Roberts, and uh, please share your presentation. Thank you, Kathy. Um, can you guys see it okay from your side? Perfect, perfect. So um, full disclosure before I start, my, uh, my wife had to run off and leave me with our 100-pound bull mastiff, and she's sleeping, so... Uh, I'll try not to wake her up, or to, uh, but if at least if you hear her, she'll be louder than me for sure. But uh, hopefully, we'll get through this. She just ate. It's uh, the topic is a broad one here, uh, the title, but obviously we're going to uh, have more of a focus on breast cancer, which is over eighty percent of the referrals that we would get for um, uh, fertility preservation in the female. So it's the it's the bulk of our practice um regardless and about 15 percent of uh, breast cancers uh, do occur in premenopausal women which are not necessarily the uh, the fertile um, patients the window of fertility but uh, at least two percent uh, are in the what we would deem as the optimal fertility group which is under 35 but above 20 and we're not generally seeing women under 20 of course for for fertility issues uh, one would hope. Uh, importantly, about 5 to 10% of them have uh, hereditary breast and ovarian cancer, which is important since we can now screen embryos for these, these diseases. So all in all, in Canada, we're talking about 1,000 um, women a year uh, that are in potential need of, um, of the fertility preservation services. So I'll go through the, uh, some of the assessment of fertility. Uh, the impact uh, that the treatments have, which is uh, principally the chemotherapies, uh, fertility preservation options, of course, and then 
uh, what do we do in, in future for, uh, for pregnancy? So the, um, the diagnosis um, has two effects, uh, the treatments themselves and time. So going through this often delays getting pregnant. Um, the effect is uh, purely on the ovary, nothing that uh, a woman that has breast cancer goes through would affect the, uh, the uterus. Um, so we're talking the egg and there's two concepts there. There's the egg quality, which is most uh, closely tied with age and egg quantity, uh, which we refer to as ovarian reserve. So fertility uh, declines uh, more rapidly after age 35. And this is seen in uh, populations of um, uh, populations where um, they're not using contraception. So the, the classic study is uh, of, of hydrite women. Um, so there's a, after 35, a fairly steady drop in, in fertility. Canada is just, we just don't see as many babies. Uh, we're not as prolific that way, but there, no matter what country you pick, you're going to have the same decline. And this seems to be related to the DNA, uh, specifically the chromosomes within eggs. Over 90% of errors that would cause uh, an embryo not to grow or, or from the egg side. Um, only one you're generally going to see at birth is an extra chromosome 21, and that would be Down syndrome. But even with those, uh, it's thought over 80% are lost as a miscarriage or just uh, don't get, allow for pregnancy. And now we're seeing uh, direct evidence through genetic testing of embryos. And this is the number of normal or euploid embryos uh, chromosomally uh, decline at the same time after age 35 with the same same curve. So there's a lot of indirect evidence that we're dealing with uh, genetics. So in terms of egg numbers, we start out with around 6 million eggs, and that's actually as, as a fetus, and we start to lose eggs around 18 weeks uh, while we're still in our mother. Um, around birth, there's, a, there's about a million, and by the first period, we're down around 300,000 later 30s, uh, around 30,000. By the time the period stopped, we're, we're dealing with around uh, third, uh, 300 eggs. So there's actually only around uh, 300 that are ovulated uh, through the, our whole lives. Most are lost uh, for a variety of reasons. Chemotherapy uh, doesn't seem to affect the egg itself, but there's a drop in egg numbers suddenly. And breast cancer treatments are, are fairly uh, toxic to the ovary, so there's immediate loss of eggs. And then the loss of eggs seems to follow the same trajectory. It's just logically with your eggs, menopause is going to occur earlier and likely uh, fertility issues. So there's two ways of testing for egg reserve. So when patients come in, um, they're almost always going to have at least these two tests to know how many eggs we're dealing with, sort of where, where um, she is in her reproductive life. Um, Serum or blood anti-malarian hormone has really revolutionized how we measure egg numbers. It's a hormone that seems to control um, which egg is picked each month. It's what we call a ovarian follicle gatekeeper. So it suppresses most of the eggs. There's hundreds that are selected each month. This hormone allows for one to be picked, uh, sort of the strongest uh, follicle, uh, which is the structure that contains the eggs. It's the fluid-filled structure with the eggs. It's secreted by the supporting cells around the egg called granulosa cells. And the level uh, importantly seems to stay stable throughout the menstrual cycle. So you can come in at any point in the menstrual cycle and have this test done to know how many eggs we're uh, potentially working with. And it seems to be the most sensitive of the markers and is affected earlier in life. So um, we get um, earlier and a faster uh, answer. The other is just to simply measure the size of the ovaries, the bigger an ovary is, the more eggs are in it. And we can count the up and coming egg units, uh, the follicles as little black dots on ultrasound. And those are called antral follicles. So we just count those, it's called an antral follicle count. So we just tell the patients it kind of looks like a chocolate chip cookie. Um, and uh, we want a lot of chips in there, the more, more follicles, more eggs. Uh, assessed by ultrasound. And then we also get a, a sense of the page, patient's anatomy, which is important. Uh, we'll see why. So what does chemotherapy do to the ovary? Well, the um, almost all uh, regimens would have what's called an alkylating agent, cyclophosphamide being the, 
the classic one. Uh, those are called cell cycle nonspecific uh, chemotherapies. They affect all cells. Um, vast majority of eggs are kept as what are called primordial follicles. They're the inactive uh, eggs within the ovary. So it has a direct effect on those, and that would be important because that's what can lead to ovarian failure. In, in breast cancer regimens, that's about 20% of patients that have that. Um, all chemotherapies, including the cell cycle specific ones, the ones that are more active at the growing um, cells, uh, affect the growing follicles logically. Uh, so these are the ones that are in the last few months of development and, and potentially going to ovulate. So those are almost always affected, and that's why periods stop. So patients will often call worried that they're going into ovarian failure when in actual fact they just have this temporary loss of uh, menstrual function because of that. You lose the follicle, so we also lose that AMH hormone. So then there's no suppression or less suppression of the follicles, and you get a rapid recruitment uh, we call burnout. So once an egg has been selected and starts to grow, it's going to be lost. So it's thought that most of the eggs are actually lost through the loss of the inhibition. And once they start growing, they're eventually going to die off three to four months down the road. So what options do patients have? Well, the, um, the focus should really be for, for anything we do on conceiving naturally. So uh, anything we can do to allow for natural pregnancy is not going to just make it cheaper for the couple. It's also going to uh, improve on outcome. Uh, a natural pregnancy is considered a lower risk pregnancy. Uh, so being around us and doing treatments um, can ultimately increase your chances of pregnancy, but also increase risk. So the least we're doing is following uh, with fertility testing, counseling uh, to, to know how fertile uh, the patient is after going through treatment. So we, we will do serial testing. Um, it's nice to have a baseline, especially an AMH test before chemotherapy. They'll typically come back to us um, six months to a year after, and we'll repeat the testing and get a sense of what the chemotherapy did to the ovaries, uh, which is critical. Um, the other is uh, getting pregnancy uh, sooner than later. Uh, we call an interval pregnancy. So um, that can be done um, uh at any point after chemotherapy is finished and allow for, for breaks to get pregnancy, uh, patients will come to us and we're often given timelines of a year to, to get pregnancy. Um, so that, that means the patients are younger and they have a higher chance of a natural pregnancy. So uh, that's, of course, case by case. Um, the other is to, uh, if we can protect the ovary in some way, to maybe make the chemotherapy less uh, toxic to the ovary, uh, and those are called GnRH uh, agonists. And those were used um, commonly in the past as part of the, the treatments for estrogen uh, uh, ER positive tumors, estrogen sensitive tumors. So these agents, and they're, they're given as a, we call a depot injection, which is a month, once a month injection. And they, they shut down um, the pituitary system, which is what makes the fertility hormone uh, that drives egg development called follicle stimulating hormone. So it shuts that area down um, and it makes the ovary essentially quiet. So it's thought to be less sensitive to the chemotherapies. These agents were used in the initial trials and they found that um, the patients that were randomized to those treatments uh, had a lower risk of ovarian failure. So that's what tweaked us to their use. Um, proper trials, randomized trials show that uh, the risk of ovarian failure, which is um, loss of ovarian function because of uh, depletion of eggs, is reduced by about 50%. And that's true of both ER negative and ER positive uh, pathologies. Uh, no proven benefit in, in the lymphoma patients, which is the other uh, essentially 20% of patients that we see. And there's a variety of mechanisms that are thought to um, be at play here, but probably that it's just making the cells uh, quiet. So if they're less meta metabolically active, then probably less sensitive to the chemotherapy. And others like reduced blood flow, and there may be some direct effects there um, as well. The other is uh, fertility treatments in future. So if, if pregnancy is not help happening, then patients are coming to us as fertility patients. And um, one obvious uh, method, uh, still the standard method worldwide, is just to get the eggs out of the situation. So protecting them from the chemotherapy by, by banking them in the lab. And that's through the process uh, called in vitro fertilization or, or IVF. 
Um, embryo uh, freezing or embryo crop preservation is um, been used for many years. Um, it's what's done to embryos that are left over from the IVF process that aren't put in, we call fresh or immediately after making embryos. So they can be stored indefinitely. They retain their potency of the day they were frozen. Um, requires ovarian stimulation and IVF. So we have to stimulate the ovaries with the only hormone that makes eggs, which is the follicle stimulating hormone from the brain. We give it as an injection and the patients administer it themselves. Um, very established uh, technique, uh, very effective. Does, of course, require sperm, and that's either uh, uh, partner sperm. Uh, or back in the day where we, we couldn't freeze eggs well, we, we'd even encourage, encourage patients to consider um, purchasing sperm just to be able to make embryos and have a chance of pregnancy in future. Um, with recent advances over the last 10 years, um, uh, the likelihood of uh, we call a clinical pregnancy per embryo has increased greatly, um, generally in the 40 to 60% range per embryo. So the more embryos that we can get, the better. And there's millions of babies uh, on earth from this, from this technology. The other is to freeze eggs or oocytes. Uh, again, requires stimulation of the ovary. Uh, so it's the embryo before it's been fertilized. Um, don't require sperm. Um, provides reproductive autonomy. So in future, the patient just decides what uh, what sperm source to use. Does have some technical challenges of being a very difficult cell to freeze. They're, they're large uh, and they're full of water. So just like freezing something at home uh, it would tend to explode unless you remove the water from it or minimize the amount of water. And so for these cells, you have to remove it through uh, we call crowd pr protectants and replace that. But it's a a very large cell full of water that's uh, not easy to prepare in that respect. Um, and there's fewer than a million babies born worldwide. It's just a newer technology and not, not as uh, commonly applied um, because still a lot of patients are coming to us with, with a, a sperm source. So how many eggs do we need to freeze to help? Um, well, this is all based on um, we call social or elective egg freezing um, information. So patients that come to us um, wanting to preserve fertility um, on an elective basis. Um, average patient would present at exactly age 35. Uh, my experience, over 90% of patients are, are 35. And there's various models to determine how many eggs we need to freeze to give a reasonable chance of pregnancy in future. And uh, the benchmark is 75% chance of a live birth. So you can see, as you get older, you need more eggs to get there. So if you have a patient over 40, um, we're generally not going to get that many eggs. It would require multiple cycles. And for, for the cancer diagnosis, we often have time uh, for a single cycle. But these are the models, and this is based on IVF data. Yeah. But younger um, patients require fewer eggs, logically. So how do we do IVF? So uh, the whole process is about two weeks. So we need... Uh, typically, we'll give, be given a timeline from, from oncology saying, and we're, most of us are on an email basis, so they'll say, you know, Jeff, you have to this date, we want to book chemo, um, um, and uh, we try to honor that date. It's difficult to change, and of course, we don't want to affect care. So two weeks is usually the, the timeline we, we follow. Uh, during that time, um, we don't want estrogen. When we make an egg, it comes with a set amount of estrogen. So if I make 10 eggs, the amount of estrogen would be about 10 times higher than in a natural cycle. Um, no known effect um, clinically, but we just don't wanna see it. So we'll use letrozole, which suppresses, as you may know, estrogen during uh, treatments. It's normally used for months at a time. We're using it just during the period of, of making eggs. So starting the process is giving, like I mentioned, the, the hormone follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. So it's given for an average 10 days. The patients uh, inject that themselves. And then we follow egg development on ultrasound as follicles. So the size of the follicle will dictate um, whether or not the egg inside is mature. So they come in each morning, typically before work, early in the morning. At some point, we need to give what's called a, a GnRH antagonist, which protects those eggs from being ovulated. So we don't want them falling out. We want them to stay in. So these medications block the ovulation signal from the brain. And then at some point we need to actually 
mimic ovulation, and that's with an injection called HCG. Uh, another one called a GnRH uh, antagonist, like we used for protecting the ovary, can be given as a single shot to mimic ovulation, and then the egg will think it's about to be ovulated. And then 36 hours later, we take the eggs out. So the eggs themselves think they're going through a natural cycle. They're taken out, fertilized, and then typically grown for five days before they can be used. And in a usual IVF cycle, they're put in. Pregnancy test is done nine days later, and then we follow them through pregnancy. Of course, for this process, they're not getting pregnant. We're freezing them as either eggs on the day that we take them out or embryos after five or six days of development. So that's an IVF cycle uh, in short. So the, the procedure part of it is uh, called an egg retrieval. So it's done as a, a transvaginal procedure. Um, when you make the ovaries large, typically they fall into the area called the cul-de-sac, just in behind the uterus. And we can get at that uh, with, with um, a vaginal ultrasound and then a needle alongside of it. Uh, and it's guided into the, the follicle. Um, that's uncomfortable, of course, having a needle in the ovaries. The patients are under sedation. Typically takes about um, 10 minutes to do. Yeah. The patients go home typically about an hour later. So the other option I, I mentioned here, uh, ovarian tissue freezing, um, kind of a big topic. Um, for breast cancer, it's not practically um, used. Uh, there is uh, concerns with the technology, uh, the least of which is it's not very effective. Um, very few babies born after decades of use. Um, there's a concern with breast cancer because it's a more systemic disease of reseeding the patient with disease uh, and also requires surgery to remove ovary. So it's not, not commonly used. So what about future pregnancy? Well, about fewer than 10% of patients actually end up becoming pregnant in the future. And there's probably a variety of reasons for that. Some, uh, of course, just don't want to be pregnant. Uh, there's that delay of time. Um, but um, but but many want pregnancy, of course, as we know. Um, seems to be safe to proceed with pregnancy at any point after chemotherapy, uh, even before initiating any sort of uh, hormonal therapies. Um, just getting pregnant and breastfeeding seems to be protective, although we may be looking at what we call a health healthy user bias, which is uh, just the healthiest of patients are conceiving. So it may be the other way around. Um, I don't think many of us believe that pregnancy itself is actually protective, but the eggs themselves, if you get pregnant from them, seem to be normal. There doesn't seem to be an increased risk of uh, birth defects or other issues with these babies born of, uh, of the survivors. But um, for the most part, patients are asked to wait the two years to allow for um, surveillance of their disease. So if we have eggs and embryos, um, we, uh, we can put them back later through what's called a frozen uh, embryo transfer. Uh, and that's just preparing the uterus to accept embryos. Um, so that's either done through a natural cycle or we call a program frozen embryo transfer. Natural cycle is just using um, the natural cycle to prepare the lining and then putting that back on at a time that the embryo would normally uh, end up there. Uh, problem is a lot of patients do have some menstrual dis disruption because of the, the treatment. So we'll most commonly use what's called a program cycle, which is using estrogen um, either orally through the skin or, or vaginally to prepare the uterus. And we just try to, through various means, um, minimize uh, risks uh, medically and, uh, uh, and, and with the cancer itself. Um, and then just briefly, um, we do have the ability to genetically test embryos. Uh, typically, this is done when patients come back after their diagnosis with BRCA would be the most common. So they're getting that later on after embryos have already been frozen. So we'll, we'll, we are able to, to thaw embryos and retest them for the disease. And then also for the, uh, the, the balance of DNA within the uh, embryos called aneuploidy. So we can pick embryos that are more likely to work and importantly, ones that are unlikely to work. So if they come back as aneuploid or unbalanced, we don't use those ones. So between this and the genetic testing, we can get the embryos that are more likely to get them pregnant with a healthy child and minimize the amount of treatment in future. So if they're diagnosed with it, almost all patients I find test for, for BRCA within the embryos. Of course, they don't want to pass along the disease. Yeah. And putting the embryo in is fairly simple. There's no sedation required. We have 
an assistant do an ultrasound of the uterus and then we place an embryo catheter in and we can see where the tip is and place the embryo at a very specific location at the top of the uterus. Um, procedure takes under five minutes. Uh, they go home and uh, they do a pregnancy test nine days later and, and hopefully it works. So lastly, um, I, and it's something that's brought up in the initial visit with all patients is ultimately they don't have to do anything. They can either just try to conceive naturally in future they don't have to bank eggs and embryos, and most patients do not. But if for whatever reason they lose ovarian function because they've lost eggs, um, patients ultimately have the ability to uh, obtain uh, eggs from other women. Uh, and that's either through the egg banks or from, from relatives or friends. Uh, that's done up to the age of 50 um, because any uterus will work at any point in our lives. Um, but age 50 is, is deemed as the... Uh, the safety cutoff for, for pregnancy. Um, doesn't require a normal menstrual cycle. We actually, it's easier to get uh, pregnancy without a menstrual cycle because we're only working with the uterus. Uh, it's just, it's an expensive process uh, in around 20,000 Canadian. Uh, pregnancy rates are high uh, per embryo. We're talking uh, almost 60% or higher. Uh, typically six eggs that patients obtain uh, uh, produce uh, around three embryos. So the chances are high. Wow. So I'll leave it at that. Um, yeah. Yeah, sorry, that I covered a lot of ground there, but. did You covered questions? a lot of ground, but, th but that's important because um, I, I'm sure it answered a lot of questions that we really can't get to because of the time. But uh, a couple of questions come to mind. Uh, what are the side effects from the chemo protection uh, agent that uh, patients get? Because patients are undergoing so much and they have a lot of side effects. This would right. add to side effects. Right. Yeah, so um, it, it's often hard to differentiate that from the chemo itself because um, like I mentioned, you do lose the ovarian function for a period of time we call ovarian shock. Uh, and that's associated with low estrogen and um, uh, hot flushes and symptoms that are similar to the uh, to the injections. But if you shut shut off the menstrual cycle completely, uh, the, the patient would feel menopausal. So it's given as a monthly injection. I can't, I don't get a lot of patients or maybe they're not expressing it to me that stop the medication because of that. But classically it would give uh, hot flushes because of the low estrogen. And then we're left with a situation where it's difficult to add back, right? Because we don't want to put the patient on a lot of estrogen. So it's a tough spot, but uh, if they're not tolerating it, they just don't get the second injection. The injection is once a month while they're on chemotherapy. So the patients call us, our, our nurses will administer it. We can get usually the medication at cost, or there is a, a compassionate program through AbbVie. Um, but they tell us when they're done chemo and then we stop injecting. So we use the patient to tell us what to do. So we're not bothering the, the onc team. Right. Okay. Yeah, some don't tolerate it. Correct. Yeah. Some don't. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, another question comes to mind is that patients that are um, uh, diagnosed with uh, HR positive, right? With hormonal receptor uh, breast cancer. Do these patients come and worry about getting pregnant because of the estrogen once they become pregnant for recurrence of uh, the cancer? For sure. Um, yeah, like I can, I can throw, um, you know, patients that want the data, we can throw survival curves at them and all the studies to show that both getting pregnant is actually protective when you look at the studies, but with the caveat that it probably is not protective. Uh, I go the other way. I'll say, well, the studies show that this is how you, you have to interpret it. These are the healthiest of people probably trying to get pregnant. If you're not healthy, you're not trying to get pregnant. So you're out of that group. So th there's the uh, the concern even from my side that sure pregnancy may affect recurrence. So it's just, they have to be careful. Ultimately it's the safest thing to do is to do nothing, right? right. To not do any treatment through us and, and to just focus on the, the, the cancer itself. Um, but there's been a large, uh, there's a large set of data now to show that going through banking is not associated with an increase in recurrence. So the treatments themselves are not, uh, that's been looked at now fairly widely, but but yeah, there's the theoretical risk that we're stimulating cancer cells somewhere in her body. 
And I, I never tell them that's sa completely safe, that there's that theoretical risk. Yeah. And then it's their, their decision, of course. Yeah. But they do worry. I think they all worry. I would, I would assume. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And that would be primarily with HR positive or all uh, biology? I, I actually assume in, in, in our protocols, everyone's the same. So okay. even if someone is ER negative, I assume uh, cancer is chaotic. I assume that they have ER positive tumor somewhere in their body. I, I don't think cancer is one or the other. Um, for sure, there is ER sensitive tumor in their body. I just assume everyone has it. Obviously, uh, ER, ER negative uh, triple negative patients are treated more aggressively with chemo and have neoadjuvant more often or all the time. But, um, but I assume that there's some estrogen there. So whenever we do treatment, we're always trying to minimize it or eliminating eliminate estrogen exposure. We call load. Yeah. And, Irrespective uh, of the pathology. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, during pregnancy, if a woman is on, um, uh, uh uh, tamoxifen or, uh, you know, I guess it would be tamoxifen, not lethrozole, uh, an AI, uh, if they're younger, would that interfere in any way with the pregnancy and the, the health of the, of the pregnancy? Uh, well, they normally have a, they have a washout. So, uh, my experience and I don't pretend to be an oncologist. So, uh, obviously work closely with them, but I, I have them set the time the parameters for pregnancy, uh, not me. So um, normally I'm seeing them uh, give a three month washout, but no, they can't be on it. it it's, it is oddly enough, a fertility medication, tamoxifen. It stimulates egg production, um, but it's an anti-estrogen. So you can't use it in pregnancy, of course, but uh, it can be used right up to pregnancy from our data. Um, but oncology prefers to have a washout from their data. So obviously uh, they're they're in charge, not us. Yeah, yeah. Great, so thank you, thank you so much for answering those questions, and thank you for a very um, you know educational presentation. That was really wonderful. Thank you very You're very. You're welcome. Much. And the dog didn't wake up, so that's good. And the dog behaved. That's great. Yes. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, everyone. So uh, we're gonna move on and. Uh, we're going to uh, continue with our Q&A, uh, introducing um, Dawn Sigiliano. Uh, she is a Canadian certified genetic counselor at LifeLibes Genetics. She is an integral part of the clinical team involved in service development and delivery of LifeLabs Genetics, and as well as counseling, education, and training. Welcome, Dawn. Thanks for having me. Can you see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Great. Again, thank you for inviting me to give this presentation today. I'm excited to be here. Um, so I'll just start with uh, an outline here. Let's see if my slides are moving. There we go. So I'm hoping to go through just some basic information on genetics and how it relates to the development of cancer. Um, I wanted to discuss some key players in hereditary breast cancer, uh, specifically BRCA1 and 2, but also, also briefly touch on a couple others. And then talk about some genetic testing results and how it can impact management. And then lastly, go through some genetic testing options. All right. So before I go any further, I wanted to make sure I don't lose anyone too quickly. Um, so I'll just start off with some genetics 101 and how it relates to cancer. So we actually have about 30 trillion cells in our body. And in these cells, we have our DNA or our genes, and that's our genetic blueprint. So this DNA or our genes are packaged into chromosomes. Now, we have pairs of chromosomes because we get um, one, one gene or one set of chromosomes from each parent. So half our genetic material is from each parent. So our genes or our DNA is essentially a letter code of A, C, T, and G in various combinations. So a specific DNA code makes up a gene and um, our genes are read 
just as we would read a, a book. So we would read words in a book. And from that specific word, uh, the gene makes a protein. And now the protein goes and has a very specific function in the body. So for example, we have a protein that's responsible for our heart to develop properly and beat properly. We have proteins that determine the color of our eyes or the color of our hair. And that's all coded from our genes. Now, sometimes spelling mistakes can happen in our genes that cause the protein to not be made properly. So again, using the analogy of words as genes, if the word has a letter change in it, then it potentially changes the meaning of that word entirely. So for example, if we have the word house, but we change the H to an M, obviously that changes the meaning of the word entirely. It also goes for if a word has an extra letter in it or a missing letter. So for example, if we start off with the word planet and we move, remove the E, all of a sudden that word is now changed to plant, which has a different meaning. So when these spelling mistakes happen in a gene, they're called mutations or pathogenic variants. So mutations can change the instructions of that protein that it's supposed to make. So if we have spelling mistakes in genes that are supposed to, or proteins that are supposed to regulate cell growth, the result is that cell is no longer regulated and can grow out of control and potentially turn into cancer. So normally all of our cells are constantly dividing. And if a cell is damaged, there will be certain chemicals and factors that are released to target it for cell death. However, if this process goes haywire, um, say by gene mutation, all of a sudden that damaged cell will not be signaled for death and it can keep on dividing and dividing and creating more damaged cells, which will lead to cancer. So unfortunately, we know cancer is common. However, inherited cancer is not. Um, we know about 5 to 10% of cancers are inherited. Now, all cancer is genetic, meaning that it involves gene or genetic mutations that happen over time in various genes, like I went through in the, um, in the previous slide illustrations. However, only a small percentage of these cancers are inherited, meaning they're caused initially by a mutation in one gene that can be transmitted from generation to generation. So if we look at the majority of cancers first, they are sporadic. Now, sporadic cancers are called multifactorial conditions, meaning they're caused by several genetic factors plus several environmental factors that all need to come together to result in cancer development. We know some of these genetic factors and or in associations, and we know some of the environmental factors, but what we don't know is that how many of these factors are needed or the combination of them to result in cancer. Some of the environmental factors we know are certainly age, smoking, UV exposure, and the list goes on. We use the analogy in genetics of a jar being filled to describe the multifactorial aspect of cancer development. So we're all born with some genetic predispositions. However, over time, we accumulate more and more environmental factors. And if that jar is filled to the top, that is the threshold where cancer will develop. And that's how sporadic cancer happens. So now I'm going to focus the remainder of my talk on hereditary cancers, which accounts for, again, the minority of cancers at about 5 to 10%. So when we think about inherited cancers, we know that there are red flags that we want to look for in families, which raise our suspicion that there is an inherited cancer in the family. So on the right hand of the slide, you'll see what we call a pedigree in genetics. So this is an illustration of someone's family tree. So here, males are squares and females are circles. So in a genetic counseling session, when we take someone's family history, we ask questions like who in the family has been diagnosed with cancer, what type of cancer and ages of onset. 
So these are all very important clues that will help us determine the chance that there is something inherited causing the cancer in the family. So some of the red flags that we would see in someone's family history are multiple affected relatives throughout generations on the same side of the family. So you can see in this family that there are several individuals um, you'll see with the red flags and DX just means age at diagnosis, but you'll see several individuals on the same side of the family with breast and ovarian cancer. Another red flag is ages of onset. So usually very early age of onset, like premenopausal breast cancer. So in this example, you'll see again, there are several young ages of um, diagnosis of cancer. We also look for patterns of cancer, like breast and ovarian together. So again, in this example, you will see that some individuals have breast cancer, some individuals have ovarian cancer. So this is another red flag that we look for. And then rare cancers, like a male breast cancer is a big red flag that can indicate that there is an inherited cancer in the family. So most inherited cancers are what we call autosomal dominant. And what that means is that there is a mutation in one gene and that's enough to develop the condition. So remember, we have pairs of genes and in autosomal dominant, there is a mutation in one of those genes and that's enough to develop the condition. There is also a 50% chance when someone has a gene mutation that they will pass it down to all of their children. Both males and females can be affected. Now with inherited cancer, it gets a bit more complicated because there is also what we call reduced penetrance. And that means that not everyone who has the gene mutation will go on to develop cancer. There's also a variable expression, meaning not everyone who has the gene mutation will develop the same type of cancer. So in this family, you can see that there is a female um, over here with both left and right sided breast cancer, which is a red flag. There are also some women with ovarian and some with breast cancer, which is a pattern suspicious again of inherited cancer. And it's also evident here that this male in the second generation likely has a mutation, a gene mutation, and has passed it down to his daughter who's developed breast cancer, but he's experiencing reduced penetrance because he does not have cancer. All right, so let's... Now focus on the key players for inherited breast cancer. So BRCA1 and BRCA2, otherwise known as BRCA1 and BRCA2. And this is actually a picture of someone's chromosomes. Um, it's what they look like under a microscope. It's called a karyotype. And this is just showing the locations of BRCA1 and BRCA2 on the chromosomes. So the incidence of BRCA1 and 2 mutations in the general population is about 1 in 300 to 1 in 500. We do know that certain ancestries have a higher prevalence of BRCA1 and 2 mutations, like the Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry, as well as Dutch and Icelandic ancestry. So what do BRCA1 and 2 do? Well, like I explained earlier, everyone has two copies of both BRCA1 and two copies of BRCA2, one inherited from one parent, one inherited from the other parent. So their role in the body is to stop abnormal cell growth. So they're called tumor suppressor genes. So you can think of, I'll use for example, BRCA1, but it works the same for BRCA2. You can think of them like a stop sign. So if someone has a mutation or a spelling mistake in one of their copies of BRCA1, they would have inherited that either from mom or dad. They have another good copy inherited from the other parent. And this is just showing the chromosomes here, one with a mutation, one without. Um, and that stop sign is still working because they have one good gene with no mutation in it. However, over time, that second good gene 
can get an acquired mutation through say some environmental factors. And all of a sudden they have no functioning stop sign anymore and those cells can grow out of control. So as you can see in this diagram, if we look at the bars at the very left side, the general population risk to develop breast cancer is about 12%. If someone has a BRCA1 gene mutation, the risk is elevated to 50 to 85%. For BRCA2, it's 40 to 70%. There is also a higher chance for these um, individuals who carry BRCA1 and 2 mutations to have a second primary uh, breast cancer develop. And that's also shown in the next bar over. And then other cancers that are known to be associated with BRCA1 and 2, where individuals, if they have mutations, are at increased risk for ovarian cancer, pancreatic cancer, and men are at increased risk of both prostate and male breast cancer as well. So although BRCA1 and 2 account for a significant proportion of hereditary breast cancer syndromes, there are also a, a few other key players out there. You can see here in the yellow part of this pie chart that most genes that are involved with hereditary cancers are not yet known. However, out of the known causes, BRCA1 and 2 definitely account for the majority. Now, this slide is a little bit dated, so there's certainly more, uh, more genes that we know are involved in hereditary breast cancer that aren't listed here. Um, for example, I have a current hereditary breast cancer panel that's available um, that includes most of the um, common genes associated with breast cancer, although the ones in the orange are much rarer than BRCA1 and 2. So let's move on now to genetic testing. So one thing to point out here is that genetic testing is always most informative to start in someone who has cancer as opposed to someone who is a relative, like an unaffected relative. When an individual undergoes genetic testing, which usually um, involves being tested for a panel of genes, like I showed in the previous slide, there are three possible outcomes of results. One is a negative, two is a positive, three is a variant of unknown significance. For negative results, there are true negatives and uninformative negatives, which I'll go through um, here now. So a true negative is when we already have an identified gene mutation in the family. So say someone with breast cancer has had genetic testing, we have found a BRCA1 mutation. Now, if an individual in the family um, gets tested and tests negative, we know that that is a true negative as we know the cause for the breast cancer in that family. And that individual who has a negative result is at general population risk now for developing hereditary cancers associated with that gene. And there's no further recommendations for surveillance or management aside from general population screening. Now, an uninformative negative is usually what we're dealing with in the majority of cases. And this means we did not find a cause for the breast cancer in that individual or family. Although this can be reassuring, we recommend current management based on the individual diagnosis or family history. Now, a positive test result means that a familial mutation has been identified. If the individual being tested has cancer, that is very likely the cause of their cancer. And this would impact treatment potentially and also screening. And it could also allow other family members to have testing. The last type of result is called a variant of unknown significance or a VUS. And this is when a spelling mistake is seen in a gene, but we don't know if that spelling mistake causes disease like cancer or if it's just a biological normal variant that doesn't actually cause disease. For example, we all carry changes in our DNA that cause us to be unique, cause us to have freckles, cause us to have curly or straight hair, but these don't, these variants don't cause disease. So it's really important before considering genetic testing to think about the benefits and limitations of genetic testing as it's not a one size fits all and not everyone needs or wants to be tested. So this is where genetic counseling can be important when considering testing. 
So some of the pros to consider would be it can identify if you're at high risk and provide further options for management. It can identify people in the family who are not at risk. It can help make lifestyle decisions. It can help relieve anxiety by just knowing. Some of the cons to consider are the possibility of unclear results. Um, the results indicate a probability, not a certainty. Insurance issues can come into play in various countries. However, we know that that is not a concern in Canada because we do have a bill passed. So genetic um, insurance companies can't ask about genetic testing. And then there's also the concern about anxiety, emotional distress, or impacting family relationships with genetic testing. So I just wanted to touch quickly on some misconceptions of hereditary cancer, which we often hear about. So sometimes we hear, you know, people say, or healthcare providers say, cancer is not on the father, or cancer is on the father's side doesn't matter. So it doesn't count. And we, we do know that that's false. It can come from either side of the family. We also hear that ovarian cancer is not a factor in breast cancer risk, but we do know it's an important indication of hereditary um, risk, although it's not always present. And we also hear the most important thing in a family history is the number of women with breast cancer. Certainly it's age of onset that's the most important. So moving on to some um, results, interpretation, screening, and treatment. What can be done if an individual finds out they have a BRCA1 or 2 mutation or another mutation in one of these other genes? So there's several options for the management of both breast and ovarian cancer risk. Now, specifically for breast cancer, there are high-risk screening protocols like mammography and MRI alternating every six months, as well as breast exam, both self-breast exam and clinical breast exam, chemo prevention options like tamoxifen, and then surgical options like prophylactic removal of the breasts, which we know decrease the risk of reduction um, by 90%. We know that removal of ovaries and fallopian tubes can reduce the risk by about 50% for breast cancer. So there are certain options available to individuals. So now what are some options for genetic testing? Well, every province has a hereditary cancer clinic or a general genetics clinic that will have their own criteria for who is eligible to have genetic testing. And these are specific guidelines developed in the province. Now, in general terms, someone, if they have a 10% or more chance of finding a mutation in that family would qualify for testing. And these risks can be calculated using publicly available algorithm tools that are based on personal and family history. Now, in the US, there is a national comprehensive cancer network um, that sets out criteria and surveillance and management recommendations. So some of the um, Criteria are breast cancer diagnosed at age 50 or younger, multiple primary breast cancers, either in the same breast or opposite breast, triple negative breast cancer at 60 or younger, ovarian cancer, both breast and ovarian, male breast cancer at any age, pancreatic cancer with breast to ovarian um, on the same side of the family or in the same individual, two or more relatives with breast cancer, one under the age of 50, three or more relatives with breast, ovarian, pancreatic, and or prostate cancer, Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry with breast, ovarian, or pancreatic cancer, or an individual um, who has a mutation in one of those inherited cancer susceptibility genes. If someone meets criteria to be seen at the Provincial Inherited Cancer Clinic, um, unless that person has cancer and needs testing to determine treatment, the wait lists Waitlists are unfortunately atrocious. Um, we know that some provinces, the waitlists are up to five years. So, it, you know, this is unacceptable, um, but it is the reality. So at Life Labs Genetics, we actually wanted to provide an option for people who don't meet criteria, who don't want to wait on the waitlist. So it's a private, a self-pay option for genetic testing and counseling, which we modeled after the Provincial Genetics Clinic. So at Life Labs, anyone can have genetic testing and includes pre and post test genetic counseling, which we feel is really important. Again, when someone considers genetic testing, um, the cost varies per panel. It can be done on a blood sample or a saliva sample. Our quota turnaround time is four to six weeks. Oftentimes we're getting results back in about two to three weeks and we provide 
written consultation to both the healthcare provider and the patient following the counseling sessions. And all testing has to be ordered by a physician. Oh, so I just wanted to provide some resources. Um, if uh, we don't have time, if you can't jot them down, um, certainly you can contact me anytime. I'm going to put my contact information up. Um, and I know the, the presentation is being recorded as well. So I just wanted to say thank you and I'll open it up to some questions. So thank you very much, John, Don. That was, that was excellent. Uh, so a couple of questions that come to mind, uh, you mentioned ovarian, uh, ovarectomy prophylactic and with fallopian, I would imagine that that's being done that standard of care, correct? Well, that would be a choice for someone who has a no, BRCA. One. Both. Oh. I'm saying both. The oh, both. And the ovaries. Because yes. I don't want it, it, people to say, to think that it's just the ovaries. They must have both removed. Yes, because we know that ovarian cancer often starts in the fallopian tube. And that would be a very important discussion to have with the surgeon and the oncologist. Absolutely. Okay, okay great. And uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the misconceptions, uh, BRCA1, BRCA2, father, mother. Yes, there's a lot of confusion around that. So would you say that the BRCA1 and BRCA2 is to identify which family member passed down the gene so that they can address family members in that uh, parent and, yes, so. and, the, and the treatment and the, and everything else will be treated the same, whether it's BRCA1 or BRCA2, correct? Yes. Yeah. So the, the, to try to find out what side of the family it is, we encourage both parents if they're living to get tested just so we can start, you know, help the individual um, identify and communicate that risk to other family members. Yeah. And uh, I would say in terms of getting the genetic testing, obviously the uh, Life Labs has, you know, a uh, great resource and people can, can go to that. And uh, would you say that there are other um, genetic testings that people should be aware of that are not the same as being tested in labs such as yours? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, like recreational testing facilities, something like 23andMe, um, they have, you know, the ancestry, but they also have the health assessment um, information and they do include uh, BRCA1 and 2. Um, however, just to be cautious of those because they're not a clinical test. And for example, they're only testing for a handful of these mutations in BRCA1 and BRCA2. They're not sequencing gene from start to finish. So if you are told that you have a negative result, that is not a full test that you're getting, as well as it's not a certified lab. So we don't know how accurate those results are. So I would always highly recommend if you're going the private route um, to either get some information from a genetic counselor or a geneticist or a specialist on where to go. Life Great. Labs does have the option for anyone to contact a genetic counselor. It doesn't cost anything. Ask to speak with a genetic counselor at Life Labs. We could always let you know, you know, various labs out there or your provincial lab, provincial clinic to be referred to. Great. Thanks. So on one of your slides, you identified the uh, most commonly uh, diagnosed, uh, the Ashkenazi Jewish population, and you said unique French Canadian. Is that because it's not the same as the BRCA? Why do you identify it differently? So those are unique mutations in that group. So French Canadian population have very specific mutations that we see in BRCA1 and BRCA2. So again, if you did testing generally at any provincial health clinic or through Life Labs, we're actually testing the gene from start to finish. So we're looking for any mutations that can be apparent. But if you're doing something like 23andMe again, they're only testing for a handful of mutations. So you might miss the French Canadian mutations in there or a different ancestry with their mutations. You can kind of think of it again, like a book, whereas Life Labs or the provincial health clinics are sequencing. So if BRCA1 is a book, the lab is sequencing from start to finish of that book, every chapter, every word, whereas something like the recreational labs, 
they're only looking in chapter one, chapter five, and chapter nine. So you could be missing other things. And how commonly known is it that there is a French Canadian mutation across our country? And do physicians uh, know to ask about that genetic testing? Not typically, but if again, if you're ha if you're a, a person of a French Canadian population and you're having testing at any reputable lab, um, you're going to be tested for those mutations, and they're going to actually take your. That's when we take a family history. We always ask the ethnic ancest ancestry background of each side of the family just to give us clues. But we're actually testing gene from start to finish, so we'll pick up any mutations that are there. And so one final question, because we're coming, we're running out of time. We can go on for a long time. Uh, you mentioned saying that once one person is tested and it's negative, it's negative. But cancer can be in your body for a long time. You may not have it today. You may have it, you know, years to come. Now, the, the thought is, if it's negative today and you're 30 something, is it possible that there could be a switch in terms of that gene becoming positive? And do we recommend being retested? Great question. So that is not true for what we call germline mutations. So inherited mutations you are born with, and that does not change. So if you have a germline test for say BRCA1 and 2, and it's negative, that will not change in your lifetime. What can change is those sporadic cancer mutations. So in your tumor specifically, or in tissue, you can acquire mutations in BRCA1 or 2. But those are not throughout your body. They're not in your blood. They cannot be passed down. They're just very specific, sporadic or somatic, it's called mutations. So those can change over time. Thank you. That clarifies yes. Thank you very much. We're coming to You're the end welcome. of the session. That was excellent. And again, this concludes our session. Once again, thank you to all our guest expert speakers. It was phenomenal for sharing their knowledge with us today. Thank you again to our sponsors, Novartis, Pfizer, Gilead, AstraZeneca, Merck, Daichi, Senko and Life Labs Genetics. Following this session, you will get a link to complete a survey to provide feedback on this session. Please consider leaving feedback as this helps us improve future sessions for attendees like yourself. Everyone have a wonderful afternoon and thank you very much.